with the invocation. Heavenly Father, thank you for um, this wonderful time of fellowship that we get to enjoy every week. And thank you for this organization that we get the privilege to be a part of. Thank you for the wonderful meal and, the, and the, please bless the hands that have prepared it and who faithfully prepare it for us every week. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's face the flag, right hand over your heart, and I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, milestones. Uh, Laura Antoine, August 3rd, birthdays. Bill Bryce, August 7th. Spouses' birthdays, Fred Sellers, wife Kathy, August the 5th. Anniversaries, Bill and Donna Connor, 49 years on August the 1st, Bill. Russ and Debbie Phillips, 24 years on August the 5th. Curtis and Charis Wren, 36 years on August the 6th. Gordon and Rita Willoughby, 32 years on August the 8th. Club anniversaries, Shelley Rodiker, two years on August the 19th. Salute. Now I want to take one moment to ask y'all to do something. On, on your table, you'll find our trumpet. And that gets sent out every week, but also has on the second page of the trumpet, if you look in the upper, upper right, it has a list of the people who are scheduled for this week, next week, and the following week for the prayer, pledge, and milestones. Please take a moment each week to look at that and look at the weeks in advance so that you know when you're scheduled and, and if you wanted to, the way you won't feel like you're surprised each time. <laughs> I, I know no one likes to be surprised, but I also know that these folks here just stand up and do stuff and, and they don't even need a lot of preparation. So I'm not worried at all. Um, it just makes it much easier on everyone if you're able to do that. Yes, who brought a guest today? Will Brawl, want to go ahead and stand up and introduce your guests? My guest today is Will Hotman. Uh, my guest today is Deion Smore. He's a new town like I am and works uh, with New York Life. George, yes, we do have a new member induction. Steve Dooley. Steve, it is my great pleasure on behalf of the board of the, and directors 
and members of the Rotary Club of Georgetown, Texas to welcome you as a member. You've been selected for membership because your fellow Rotarians believe you will manifest the characteristics that will allow you to impart the message of Rotary. Rotary is an organization of business and professional people pledged to uphold the highest professional standards. Rotarians believe the worldwide fellowship and international peace can be achieved when professional men and women are united under the banner of service. You are a representative of Rotary in all phases of your professional and personal life. The community will know and judge Rotary by the embodiment of it in your character and service. You've been selected for membership because we know our principles and our standards are safe in your keeping. Rotary is not a political organization, but Rotarians are vitally concerned with everything pertaining to good citizenship. Rotary is not a charitable organization, but our activities throughout our community and the world exemplify our responsibility to help others. Rotary is not a religious organization, but our beliefs are built on eternal principles that have been the moral compass of people throughout the ages. This day may mark the beginning of many years of devoted service and fellowship, or it may not. Above all else, what Rotary gives to you and what, Rotary is, what you give Rotary is entirely your choice. You will have opportunities to serve on a community, on a committee, in one of our areas of service, and to attend numerous functions related to Rotary activities. What you do with these opportunities is your choice. We encourage you to be more than just a member of a Rotary Club. Instead, we encourage you to choose to be a Rotarian. By the way, I might mention, Stephen Dooley does not really need this kind of a charge. This is a formality that our club does. Uh, he has been uh, Assistant Regional uh, Rotary Foundation Coordinator for the Zone. He is also past District Governor of Rotary. Mm -hmm. So we have no doubt that he will embody the spirit of service above self as he joins our club. Ladies and gentlemen of the Georgetown Rotary Club, please welcome our newest member, Steve Dooley. Thanks for allowing me to be a member of this club, and I, uh, I agree with those words. I will be a Rotarian, not just a, uh, a member of the Georgetown Rotary Club. But uh, I look forward to it. Rotary, to me, has always helped me focus on the things that are important in life, and I look forward to continuing that with this club. So thank you very much. Um, he's in charge of what New Generations, which we used to call the Youth Services, and he's looking for some awesome Rotarians to help in specific areas, Early Act First Night, Interact, American Heritage Girls, Ryla, and Youth Exchange. So if you're interested in any of those areas or, or looking for a place to, to work and make a really big difference, this is, this is one of the major focuses of our entire club, and that's Youth Services. So New Generation. Chris, Chris Cash, come on up here. <laughs> he doesn't know what's going on. Just read the slide. Oh, there you go. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Why am I up here? Why? Because, you know, we normally do one ramp build a month, and we did, basically, we didn't quite finish it the first time, so, um, so Chris led the team and... Larry was there. Well, yeah. I didn't leave. But I'll, <laughs> I'll ask the people to stand. Glenn Beck, Henry Yu, Randall Surrey, Larry Bingham, Tom Thornton, Roger Chappelle, Terry Falker, Larry Baird, Alan Johnson. Do you, none of you are here? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> There's one little thing I want to add to that. 
that uh, Larry had received and sent me, and this is a thank you letter. Now, we don't normally get thank you letters from people that we build ramp for. We do occasionally. And this comes from St. Stephen um, African Methodist Church. They wish, uh, the members of the church wish to express our sincere appreciation for your blessing us with a beautiful new handicap ramp for our building. What a good thing to have a ramp that is safe, easy, accessible, and so well built. God knew our need and sent you all to perform a wonderful deed. No amount of words can say thank you enough. May God bless the work you do as you continue to bless others. We will be sending financial support contribution to you in this wonderful work. All right. There you are. Amber, come on up. Hometown Hero Night. Okay, so we did a Hometown Hero Movie Night. We had a bunch of volunteers, so thank you everybody that came. Um, we specifically want to thank Jerry Berry, um, Larry Baird, Felix Boston, Allison McKee, Scott Mall, Mike Sweeney, Derek McGill, Nathan Winstead, Chief Nero, Rhonda Pritchard, Denise White, Tina McGuire, and the HG girls that came. So you could all stand, everybody that helped. Thank you very much. So what's exciting about this is, you know, I took the whole week off last week, right, right off to Guatemala, just, you know, basking in the sun, enjoying myself. You know, um, it was hot. If you haven't been to Guatemala in the jungle lately, it's very hot, very humid, and nothing dries unless it's sitting in the sun directly. Um, but it was a great week, um, and, uh, and I, had a lot, I had a lot of good time and got to learn a lot of things down there. We'll talk more about that next week. Um, Jeannie. Brief update on Field of Honor. Hi, everybody. Well, everything is really coming along and we're, it's gelling. This morning we had a fabulous meeting with the beneficiary committee that is working hard to narrow down some good potential beneficiaries and we're gonna involve all of you in selecting those beneficiaries. Uh, I also wanna let you know that our uh, uh, Committees that are working on sponsorships are doing a great job, and um, it is time to step up Rotarians who want to be sponsors as well. Um, all the information is on the website, so you can take a look at that, or you can give me a call and I'll send you the information as well. Um, we've got an affiliate breakfast next Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock at Mills for all the past affiliates and potential new affiliates. And we're gonna explain what's all new this year and uh, hopefully sign up some of these affiliates to be able to help them do some fundraising for their organizations that benefit veterans and first responders. So lots and lots is going on. And the next committee meeting for all of the Field of Honor is on the 13th at Mel's at 8 a.m. Thank you, George. Thank you, thank you very much. You'll notice on your table are, are these flyers. Grab as many as you want. There's more of them over there by Carol. And, uh, and hand those out. Give them out to anyone who will accept them and has any interest at all in the field of honor. Uh, next week, I will be in Dallas. So um, George Ann will take over. See, this is a great job. I just keep leaving. And y'all do more work when I'm gone than when I'm here. So I'm going to be gone more often. Have you had your day here, Carol? Great, fantastic. I don't know if you've noticed that if, if you are, if your work, and especially in, a, in a, where you're self-employed, if your business is slow, go somewhere, and it'll speed up. Mm. It will speed up tremendously. I have been going nonstop all week long. Um, just a quick calendar of events and some things I wanted to highlight on there. Obviously, you know, regular club meeting, but uh, in two weeks we'll have our um, board meeting. That is Saturday after that on the 17th. Branding and Public Image, um, great seminar down in, in um, Bastrop at the uh, McKinney Ruffs uh, uh, Nature Park. Um, great opportunity. Um, Michelle was not able to go. She's been one of one before, but she's uh, encouraging people to go. Um, and if you're at all interested in helping her and her committee, something you want to go, it's great training for everybody. Um, on the following Saturday in Georgetown, there's two different training sessions, one for membership, 
George Oliver? I'm going to be broke before this meeting's over, aren't I? <laughs> the first $100 meeting. The first $100 meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. So, George Oliver, you got folks coming to that? You need some more help with more people looking at membership? Uh, right now, we're stepping up. I think we can always use more. Absolutely. Okay, so we need more people there. Uh, Billy Ray? <laughs> he ran away? Okay. So, um, he, he's our the, the Rotary Foundation uh, chairman here, um, and uh, they're also training on the Rotary Foundation then. Next, I'd like to invite Angie up here to introduce our speaker. Hi. Uh, Marissa Austin, one of your members, a uh, special person to, a lot of, to all of us, is the executive director of CASA of Williamson County. And she could not be here today, so she, knowing that I have a special, special place in my heart for CASA, asked me to introduce the speaker today. James Arrington was raised in Abilene. He, uh, after getting his fine arts in theater at McMurray University, he got his, earned his master's degree in conflict resolution and reconciliation with a focus in dispute resolution cultural competency, and creative problem solving. If that doesn't prepare <laughs> for what he does, uh, it certainly prepared him well for his current, current position as an advocate supervisor with CASA of Wilco. That's court-appointed special advocates, very special advocates. James works with CASA volunteer advocates. He helps pull everybody that's involved in the foster children's life together and ultimately assuring that each child's needs are met in what is deemed to be in that child's best interest. So, James? Good afternoon. Uh, okay. Good afternoon, Rotarians. Uh, my name is James Arrington, and I am an advocate supervisor with CASA of Williamson County. I also have a lot of anxiety right now talking in front of you guys, so we're going to get through this, just being open and honest about that. So, uh, but thank you guys for having me today. Marissa, unfortunately, couldn't be here, so she asked for me to be here, so thank you guys. Um, I would actually like to start off with uh, it's a brief three, four minute video, kind of outlining what uh, a CASA volunteer does. So if we can make that magically appear, please. For a kid. They have school and homework, practices and games, there are doctor's appointments and detention halls. The making friends and the keeping friends, discovering who they are and who they aren't, there's so much to learn. There's this whole world out there, right here. These times are transforming in someone's story, and they can really be quite chaotic. That chaos of being a child only increases when abuse and neglect fill their home. The normal winds of chaos are now a storm. And sometimes, when the storm is so great, a child must be removed from their home. And this is a really tough day. It's complicated, and it's painful. When a child is removed from their home because of abuse or neglect, they leave their normal, and they enter foster care. The court sends them to a new place, a new home, often to a new school with new people, new everything. And all of these new things aim at a better life for the child. They aim to help in the healing process for the family. But it's still tough. They still have the school activities, the doctor's appointments, and the lessons to learn. But now court dates, visits with parents, and check-ins with social workers quickly bombard the calendar. And there's the pain of separation from what they know and where they feel comfortable. There are hundreds of children in our city who experience chaotic days like this, weeks like this, years like this. And these days, weeks, and years are difficult. They're exhausting and isolating. They're really tough. But there are ways to help. Ways to bear the burdens the child is carrying. Ways to make the days less tough. These children need to feel more supported. They need someone constant who is on their team. Someone who is fighting for their best amidst all the shuffling. And a CASA volunteer provides this help 
A court-appointed special advocate helps bear these burdens. They are the constant amidst the chaos. In the middle of all the shuffle and uncertainty, they know the child. There are still tough days, but now there's someone standing up for the child, day in, day out. Someone who knows both the biological and foster parents. Someone who meets with the teachers, doctors, and social workers to ensure the child's needs are being met. Someone who speaks for the child's best interest in court. Someone who the judge counts on for insight. Someone who cares about the child and just lets them be a kid. Someone who is there for the tough days, the great days, and the in-between days. This someone is so important. This someone is a CASA volunteer. And there are hundreds of children in our city waiting for a CASA volunteer. They're waiting for someone to speak up for them. They're waiting for someone to help weather the storm. Each child in foster care needs this support, this someone to count on. Be this someone for a child in foster care. Be their advocate. Be a powerful voice for their best interest. Be a CASA volunteer. Thank you. Um, and if we can move on to the next slide whenever you get a chance. Perfect. Uh, so CASA Williamson County was founded in 2009. What we do is we train and mentor court appointed uh, volunteers to advocate for the best interest of the child uh, who has been abused and neglected and find themselves in the foster care system. We work to guide them into safe and permanent homes and work collaboratively with the families in order to build that intentional environment of support and community around not only the children but the families as well. Next slide. So you guys might be wondering, who is a CASA volunteer? So CASA volunteers are everyday superheroes. They can be full-time employed, college students, retirees, or community members who are passionate about serving their community in another capacity outside of food service or transportation. It is truly a different volunteer experience. I became a CASA volunteer before I stepped into the advocate supervisor role because I thought it would look great on a law school resume. And what I ended up getting instead was such a more rewarding experience than I personally think law school could have afforded me because I got to interact with a child and got to interact with his family and got to work towards uh, that reunification and seeing that and seeing the growth. Next slide, please. To become a CASA volunteer, it takes an application, background check, and interview. It takes around 35 hours of initial training and then you're sworn in by one of the three judges who overhear the uh, CPS court cases. There's also 12 hours of continuing education. Um, it is said that there's more initial training that goes into becoming a CASA volunteer than there is that goes into becoming a foster parent. So I'm just gonna let that sink in with you guys about the kind of quality of training that we provide and the high level of expectations that we have for our volunteers. Next slide, please. So you guys are probably wondering, what exactly do CASA volunteers do? So CASA volunteers are education advocates, they're legal advocates, medical advocates. They connect the children to their culture by advocating for what is important to them and their families. CASA volunteers find family members to support the child and families and work collaboratively to build an intentional community of support for children and their families so that way they never have to enter into the foster care system again. That way they become stronger and healthier as a family unit. Next slide, please. You might be wondering, who exactly is a CASA child? A CASA child is anywhere from a newborn to 21 years of age who has been removed from a home in Williamson County due to abuse and neglect where CASA is appointed by the court. And just to give you guys a heads up, so CASA is a lot different than the Child Advocacy, uh, Child Advocacy Center, also known as the CAC. Uh, the CAC performs forensic interviews of children who've been abused and neglected. They extend professional services to children and their families, which is separate than what we do. We more connect them to the resources that are available in their community. Next slide, please. You guys are gonna see a bunch of numbers pop up on both of the screens. So these numbers are this, on the screens are from September 1st, 2017 to August 31st, 2018. 273 children served last year. Uh, 26 uh, recruitment and awareness events were held. We served 56% of children in care with 44% of children in care who were still in need of a CASA. Mm. That means 85 children had their, so if you look, we have 85 uh, children had their cases closed. 
47% ended in reunification, 36 were adopted or permanently living with a relative, 14% adopted or permanently living with non-relatives, 1% aged out, and then that 1% other was a special needs child who had aged out of care, and what we did is we were able to connect them to the Department of Aging and Disability Services, also known as DADS, because of the severe uh, mental health issues that this child had so that way they could be supported into their adulthood because as you would expect whenever a child turns 18 years of age and choose to exit the system it is most certainly a push and a good luck right so what we were able to do was to connect this child to uh, dads for further services Casa's goal at the beginning of the case is always family reunification which may come off as a surprise to some of you I wonder if have you ever done something if you went to college you did something in undergrad that you perhaps weren't super proud of or something in high school that you were like man only i had done that I see a couple no's around the audience a couple yeah i definitely did that i most certainly did right uh, have you noticed that over time it becomes less of a movie in your mind and more of a picture what we see is we see a snapshot in time of a really bad time in a child's life or in a family's life. Misunderstandings, mistakes were made, and I personally believe that people should be allotted grace to be able to heal from these, these traumatic incidents and to be able to move forward, move past, and move collaboratively together. Next slide, please. So you guys did hear me correctly. 44% of children still need a CASA, which also may be a surprise to you. Uh, children in care have a CPS caseworker or a five, a say or a five. If there's anyone who's ever worked uh, for the department, they know that uh, it is a hard job being a CPS caseworker. It takes a lot of heart, it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of guts. And what ends up happening is a child might go through five caseworkers in the span of a case. I myself have a case where a child is on their fourth caseworker, and the case opened nine months ago. So that's somebody who's not stable in their life. A child is also assigned an attorney ad litem. That attorney ad litem represents the child, what the child wants, also the child's best interest until CASA is appointed, where we represent the best interest of the child. But an attorney who represents what the child wants goes and visits the child once every three months before court, two months before court. Their only obligation is to go see their child before court. So that leaves a lot of months that this child doesn't have a connection uh, to their attorney. Children have basic needs. Range, ra children have needs that range from basic to intense. And there are some children that I know of who have been in care whose cases are still open today that have been open since 2012. I also know of a child whose case closed last year in a successful adoption, and that child had been in care since 2010. Next slide, please. Marissa Austin, your fellow Rotarian and Executive Director, could give you more information with regards to income expenses. Again, my undergrad was in theater, definitely not money-minded, right? I would have chosen a different, uh, different form of education. Um, so Casa of Williamson County, just to let you know, we're an independent 501c3. We are not under a state or federal umbrella. We are our own individual program. We do, however, partner with Texas CASA and with National CASA as far as education is concerned, training, resources, and best practices. And we are super proud to announce that 86% of our expenses are on the program side, and they're going to the children that we serve. To give you guys an idea, it costs around $2,000 to provide one CASA to one child for one year. It also goes for recruiting and retaining the highest quality staff. Marissa wanted me to include that in there. This is upset Dan and up here, so it's great. Next slide, please. Um, you guys might be wondering what's kind of new going on at Costa. If you haven't already, so please stop by our offices. 2100 Scenic Drive here in uh, Georgetown, Texas. A little bit different layout than what's up on the screen, but you guys can come in and take a look. Um, we're also looking to add another advocate supervisor position before the end of the 2019 year. We currently have four full-time advocate supervisor positions, of which I am blessed to be uh, included among. And we're looking to add, I believe, a fifth before the end of the year. Um, and our goal and strategic plan within the next 10 years is to serve 100% of the children in foster care in Williamson County. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Um, if you guys are interested, we also have several events that are coming up. We have the Casa Superhero Run on September 15th, which is going to be located at the IBM campus. This is a super fun run. If you guys have not been before, y'all don't have to run. I'm not a runner. The Bible says something along the lines of the wicked run, so <laughs> jot that down, please. Um, so, but it's super fun to be able to see not only the parents, but to see the children dressed up in superhero costumes and having a great time. It all goes towards a good cause. There's an adult 5K and a superhero. 1k and the kids get to chase villains which is pretty amazing <laughs> uh, 
We also have our eighth annual TF for Casa Golf Tournament on October 11th. Next slide, please. A couple other events that you guys would like, might want to be aware of. We have an open house at our new office, so again, if you've never visited our offices, this would be a great uh, opportunity for you to come by, visit with us, visit with some of the staff. There'll be some volunteers there. You could talk to them about their experiences if you guys are interested in being a CASA volunteer or serving in some other capacity with CASA. And that'll be at our CASA offices at 2100 Scenic on uh, August 8th from 4 to 7. We also have a soiree happening on February 29th where we partner with a couple different organizations. And Marissa Austin will be able to give you more information about that. And finally, the very best way that you can help is to volunteer as a CASA advocate or donate to a superhero cause. Or an even better way, to just spread the word that this is a phenomenal organization and a phenomenal way for you to be involved in your community. Next slide, please. I will now be taking any kind of questions that you guys might have. Yes, sir. Uh, I saw an email yesterday where somebody in our neighborhood wanted to become CASA volunteers. Yes. What, what should, who should they get in touch with? Uh, my recommendation, so Amy Sines is our Director of Talent and Recruitment and Education. Uh, they can also take a look at casawilco.org. It gives a little bit more information about uh, what does volunteerism look like, and there's an online application, and Amy uh, Sines would be reaching out to that potential volunteer. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. James, what is the next class? Uh, the, not, the, not the training class. Sure. When is the next class? Uh, I can't remember the title of it. Is it the, uh, the everything you wanted to know? About yeah, the secret life of a, of a CASA volunteer. Uh, my understanding is I think Secret Life is going to be September 15th or 16th. I don't know that exact date, uh, but I believe it, it will be up on our website. Absolutely. But uh, so Secret Life of a CASA volunteer is uh, an opportunity for you guys, if, if you have any interest in the volunteerism, to be able to come by, see Amy Science puts on a really good, uh, really good presentation. We have real life CASA volunteers there who are uh, uh, able to answer all of your questions. Yes, um, uh, you mentioned that you have a goal next year of uh, bringing that 44% that don't have CASA uh, uh, assistance uh, down to zero. Yes, sir. What is the biggest challenge to achieving that goal? So, of course, funding always continues to be a big challenge. Uh, we have four advocate supervisors, and I can tell you that our caseload, uh, we cap off at, we serve volunteers. Volunteers serve children, so I want to clarify that. We do not personally serve children. We will go out and make visits. Uh, but we serve volunteers who serve children. I can only uh, serve 30 volunteers, and I'm sitting in about 28 volunteers right now with 34 cases and we cap out at 45 cases. So the addition of another advocate supervisor position is going to be beneficial to definitely decreasing that 44% number. Yes, sir. Yes. You rather effectively and thankfully deal with results. Can you give us any insight in societal issues or norms or behavior that are the root causes Absolutely. of those results? Um, so I will tell you, just like crime, child abuse and neglect it doesn't have an address. I will also tell you that what you expect to read whenever you read an affidavit, or you watch those crime shows, for instance, where you watch, uh, I don't know, CSI, or you watch Law and Order or something like that, it's like, yeah, I expected that mom to look like that. When, when a mom is, uh, is addicted to drugs, you expect them to look a very specific way. They don't. So it's, it's, it's difficult to say what you expect. I had a case this morning actually where I have a mom who had been using for 20 years and she looks as healthy as anybody else in this room. Uh, we, we deal with a lot of, of trauma and we approach it very thoughtfully and I hope I answered your question. Um, I was wondering, I think you already answered my question though, if a CASA volunteer would have more than one client, if they would deal with multiple uh, children. Absolutely. So it really depends on the case and it depends on, we're really good at tailoring the cases to the volunteer. And what we do is we have, we have a volunteer in mind, they come in and they read the case. I have, uh, we've been getting a lot of single child cases around the ages of, of 10 and 15, anywhere in between that age bracket recently. Uh, but I've had a volunteer, one single volunteer who served as many as uh, four children at a time, and it is up to them if they feel that they can take that on with the support of their advocate supervisor and the resources that are around them. It is definitely up to them and, and based on our working relationship. So anywhere between 
one in four. We also have, sometimes have co-casas who work together and partner together for children. Who, uh, I've had a case where it was five children were removed, and uh, I had a co-casa, a male and female work. Uh, the male, of course, had the boys, and the, the, the lady had the, had the girls. Yes, sir. Yes, you mentioned that the difference between CASA and CAC yes, is that they provide direct professional resources and that you more or less refer your children out to resources in the community that could help them. My question is that those referrals that you do to exterior resources, what kind of a financial burden does that represent to the child? Um, my understanding is, is it really depends on the department and what they are able to do. Costa, what we do is we make recommendations. We look into what your local community looks like and try to make ties to, to what you have locally. It then becomes the department to try to create a special contract if a special contract is needed. So that's how that is done financially for a child. Sometimes we have been seeing where foster placement or kinship placement when a child is placed with a relative, that sometimes they take on the burden of uh, financing and paying for this child. While we would hope that child support comes in from the parents, that, that is very not often the case. Uh, so what we try to do is we try to connect them. Fostering Angels is uh, a phenomenal organization, if you guys are unfamiliar. Fostering Angels provides uh, items and some modicum of financial support to uh, families, uh, both foster and kinship. Yes, ma'am. So I, I'm actually surprised. I thought CASA worked directly with the children, and I, I learned that that's not the case. So what are the organizations that a CASA volunteer would be responsible for working with? Would they go directly to Fostering Angels, or how does, that, how does the CASA person integrate the other organizations to the child if you don't actually meet with the child? So we do actually meet with the child. Was that, was that the yes. concern? Okay, so no, we do meet with the child, and depending on where the child is placed. So we have children who are placed as close as Georgetown, and we visit with them at least once a month. It's as if you're making a connection with anybody in the room, right? You can't very well make a connection with someone in the room if you only see them on a monthly basis. Uh, so we have uh, children in care in the Georgetown area or local within an hour, and I have volunteers that go and see them every other week. We have children that's Places as close as Georgetown and children placed as far away as Missouri. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that my CASA volunteer has been out to go visit that child in Missouri. And she only has to go visit once every six months. Again, it's hard to make a connection with a child over that, right? Mm -hmm. So there's phone calls and things like that. We are, we are integrated into the lives of the children. So I just want to make, I just want to clear that. But what we do is we connect families, both foster, biological, and everybody to what's in the community. And I've mentioned Fostering Angels because I learned about them yesterday. It's a great organization uh, to help provide like target gift cards or gas cards or laptops if a children, child needs them or clothes or a bed if a child is about to do a return to monitor and they don't have a bed. They don't have a bed at the parents' home. So what we do is we're able to provide that, uh, work with Fostering Angels to provide that. <coughs> and that's it. Thank you guys so much for your time. I really appreciate it. things we do here differently than many of our organizations is we actually uh, give a book okay. to the elementary school, Pearl Elementary. We want to go ahead and get you to sign that. Thank you guys very much. Excellent. Are there any, any announcements for the good of Rotary? Thank you, James. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here. If there are no announcements, please stand and join me in reciting the four-way test. Of well, the things we, of uh, the things we think, say, or do, one, <laughs> two, two. Three. And four. We are adjourned. Good job. Thank you.